So I'm here today with Steve Keen, who's a professor at the, of economics at the University of West Sydney. Um, and he's also one of our grantees for a project called Extending Monetary Macroeconomics and Developing a Dynamic Monetary Simulation Tool. Um, welcome, Steve. Thank you, Perry. Uh, well, you call this dynamic simulation tool Minsky. Okay. Yeah. Where, so you're really trying to find a uh, computer simulation that will capture some of the insights of Minsky? Effectively. I mean, what, there's plenty of, commu of, of, of computer simulation tools in the market already. And I've been using it for 20, 25 years. Engineers have been using them for 40 years. So they're absolute stock of the trade in anybody doing engineering, which means dynamic modeling of bridges, trains, cars, mm -hmm. planes, automobiles, all that sort of stuff. But economists have been locked into equilibrium thinking all the way through. And one of the many things that you and I share in, in our interest in Minsky is Minsky was fundamentally about dynamics and change, and of course his classic phrase, stability is destabilizing. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I wanted to make it possible to model his perspective on the economy. And the, the really, to me, the, the fundamental thing that he adds in conjunction with people like Basil Moore and so on from the whole post-Keynesian tradition is the focus upon the role of the monetary system. Capitalism is fundamentally a mon monetary phenomenon, so you must model the monetary side of the economy. Now, you can try to do that with these other tools, things like Simulink, VizSim, I think Stellar, oh. but they don't handle financial transactions. Mm -hmm. And the simple reason for that is double entry bookkeeping. If you, if, I, if you lend me money, and there's minus on your account and plus on mine, if we're in two different banks, then the Reserve Bank has another minus and plus over there for the transactions. Mm -hmm. And you get four sets of, like each transaction generates not one, but four different interactions. Yeah. So this is the idea that uh, was certainly in Minsky um, mm -hmm. and in other traditions too, that we need to understand the economy as a system of interlocking balance sheets. Yeah. Um, and that that's not the existing uh, modeling uh, technologies yeah. uh, are are for physical systems, um, so that they're not uh, they're not naturally set up for that. They so, can't even, well, they don't even include money. Yeah. I mean, they're one of the great ironic things about the neoclassical perspective, and that's come up beautifully in the. I can't call it a debate, but the slanging match I had with Paul Krugman last year was that the, the neoclassical mantra is one does not include the banking sector in macroeconomics. And mm -hmm. his classic statement there was he's all for including banks in stories where they're relevant. But why are they so important to a story about debt and leverage? Mm -hmm. now, you and I in our Minsky heritage, that's absurd. Mm -hmm. So I think they are absolutely essential. So I built a way of building banking into a dynamic model. Now, in the proposal, you, you speak about um, the underlying, I guess, mathematical structure of this yep. is a combination. You've been influenced by complexity theory on yep. the one side and monetary circuit approach um, on the other side. Mm -hmm. um, what are those things? <laughs> Complex systems talks about a dynamic process involving interacting entities in a, in a system. So the classic, when we're looking at the weather in Hong Kong right now, uh, we've got a complex uh, interplay of the temperature of the water, um, the, and the, the density of particles in the air and so on. And out of um, that vision of complex interacting uh, heat passing through a fluid, we got Lorenz's model of weather dynamic, which is where the classic idea about a butterfly effect came from. And that was the very, very first complex systems model. They had three variables, the X and Y displacement of, of a body of water and the temperature gradient through the water. Mm -hmm. And out of that, we got complex cycles. The, the knowledge about aperiodic mm -hmm. chaos came out of that. So that's the, ba the basis of complex systems, to say you have interacting so systems. So the economy is sort of like the weather in that regard. But what, about the, yeah. but what about the monetary Well, Well, that's, that's where the, to model the same <clears throat> complexity in the monetary side, you have to be able to accurately account for the financial transaction between one account and another. So what about it is simply a, a banking icon. You whack a bank icon on, on a flat palette and then you double, you open up the bank and you see a set of double entry columns and if you're paying wages you get a, a, a plus wage, this is the, following the accounting convention, pluses from and minuses to, plus wage out of the uh, firms, minus wages into the workers accounts and then you model the financial dynamics and you then get the, the monetary flows in the economy as well as the physical flows. But because you have, we're seeing it as a dynamic system, you're multiplying, like on many, many occasions, two variables together. If you multiply the wage rate by labour, that gives you a non-linearity. Mm -hmm. So in an essential way, the economy is non-linear. And this program mm -hmm. makes it very, very easy to model that. But if you look at what neoclassicals are doing, they're always making assumptions about something being constant. So the wage mm. is perfect competition to set wage, you know, and same wage for everybody. Make wage a constant, you lose nonlinearity. 
So this money circuit approach, is this related to the stock flow consistency? Thing? Yeah, it's, 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 or it's a version of that? It's a version of that. I mean, uh, God, uh, Wynne Godley was also an influence upon me. I, I worked, when I wrote my first edition of Debunking Economics, Wynne was actually at the Levy at the time and I was there as well, and we interacted quite a bit. He showed me his modelling approach using stock flow consistent. I had criticisms of it mainly because it was using difference equations rather than differential equations, but we, we managed to communicate quite well. And I'm sure he influenced me to use the same thing which I now call a godly table as a way of showing the financial flows inside the, the banking icon that I build. But the inspiration for seeing the role of money really came out of the work of the circuit theorists, particularly Graziani. These are the French school, the circuit French, Italian, yeah, uh, interesting group Graziani, of people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So Graziani, I think, is probably the best. Augusto Graziani, I just, and he made the argument that working from first principles, to distinguish a monetary economy from a barter economy, you had to have money being a token. It mm -hmm. had to be something without any worth. Therefore, that to happen, you had to have it being the promises of a third agent to pay. Therefore, all relationships in capitalism are triangular. A buyer, a seller, and a bank that records the transactions. And that, to me, was the, like the, the light bulb mm -hmm. going off as to how to model strictly monetary dynamics in dynamic so modeling. So when did you encounter Graziani? Um, in your own fun life. Funnily enough, it was yeah. uh, I, I met him at the uh, wonderful conference uh, in the Hyman Minsky uh, department of Bergamo University back in '98, I think it was, and he was the, one of the chief speakers there. And so I read his paper at the time, which is the, the, the Thames paper in political economy, a monetary theory of production, and. That was the first strong influence there. I met. Um, but ninety-eight as well. is just when you got your PhD. But where did the nonlinear dynamics come from in your life? Well, that's, were you an engineer in uh, earlier no, life? I, I did. When I did my arts degree, the law as, a, as an arts law student, I did my first year choices were economics, obviously, math, psychology, and pure mathematics, which I loved. And um, so I was trained in pure mathematics to begin with in my very first year at university, and. If I take the influence one step further back at school, we had a brilliant economics teacher whose name was Keating, uh, and he explained Rosto's theory of growth to me, perfectly cyclical model. And I, that was always in my head that the dynamics and the rates of change feeding back on each other made perfect sense to me as a way of modelling the economics. So I got to university expecting to see, that's what I'd learn at university, and I got all the static equilibrium stuff while I was doing mathematics. I always, I mean, I was, uh, as a student at University in 1971, I was straight, neoclassical, believed it all, and I had a wonderful lecturer called Frank Stilwell, who's actually having his retirement speech today at Sydney University. Uh, Frank introduced me to the theory of the second best, right in the middle of first year lectures. The whole idea about, you know, the Lancastrian idea that if you, if you have both unions and a monopoly buyer of labour, would you be better off to abolish one or the other? And the answer is categorically no, you would not. And I remember seeing that result and thinking, this is crazy, because I was always taught, you know, abolish unions, abolish money, monopolies, make everything better, perfect competition vision, and simply one little element of reality comes in and the whole edifice collapses. And I just thought, there's got to be something wrong here. So that was the beginning of my critical mm. experiments. And then in 72, I ran a conference on radical economics, and in 73, I helped start the political economy movement at Sydney University, which led to the splitting of the department into an orthodox and a non-orthodox group. Um, so it's always been in my blood to do that. And I came back as an academic in my mid-30s because I went off and worked in the private sector and government agencies and charity as well, expecting things to be done in economics. And they weren't being done. And I thought, well, I better go back and give them a try myself. Well, that's an interesting story. And so now, maybe I connect that up to this yeah. project, this Minsky project. Yeah. because. Um, this idea is not just to create a nice modeling tool, um, but in fact to be of help to other researchers yeah. and as an educational tool as well. Yeah, and I had a, a fantastic uh, demonstration of that with a very, very early version, beta version, with all sorts of breakdowns and crashes in it. When I was in Mexico not long ago, back in about November, I think, of last year, and I had classes with, say, about 100 students in each class with computer terminals, and I'd take them through building the Goodwin cyclical model of the economy and have those show them, you know, put this icon here and put a divide by here and bring down this integration block and it took them about five minutes to build the model and then I said okay now press run and I got this audible <gasps> when they saw it because all the models generated cycles not equilibrium mm. and uh, that to me was a, a really deep 
indication of just how powerfully this can break people away from the equilibrium thinking that mm -hmm. totally dominates the economics even today. Now, as a research tool, so mm -hmm. not for students, but for people like me, yeah. this, this simulation tool is something that I could use too? Yeah. I mean, okay. I'd, I'd, I'd really be delighted to have you and yeah. many others take it up because one thing, like with modern monetary theory, we have all these arguments about uh, the nature of monetary flows between a government sector and a non-government and so on. And it is easy to get lost in the complexity of all that. If I look back at Graziani's work, for example, Graziani used his beautiful triangular vision, but then proved that profit was zero, mm. which is an obvious logical error. So it's easy to get caught in verbal argument and not be able to follow it through. So what, what this program does, as well as letting you put the tables for you know central bank, one private bank, another private bank, reserve transfers, et cetera, et cetera, it also generates the equations of motion of the, of the model. It can tell you what they actually are. And that is a very easy way to clarify your logic, even without doing any numerical simulation. Clarifying your own thinking. Yeah. Um, well, I look forward. I haven't had a chance to play with this myself, but I look forward to it, and I'm and I'm sure uh, the students will as well. And I thank you for coming today and, and telling us about this important important work. Thank you, and I thank you, Anna, for helping me start it all.